Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live stream. I'm John Lorenzini, aka JLo, the VP of Marketing Science here at Lift Lab. Welcome back to episode six of Curve Your Enthusiasm, talking industry topics from professors to practitioners. Today's topic is linear digital and streaming, measuring TV in the age of channel convergence with Philippe Engelbrecht. Is that I say that right? Close? Okay. That's A minus. Yeah. Solid. Okay. There we go. Uh, this episode is broken up into three different topics. The uh, the industry today, measurement strategies and approaches, and Tatari as a company. So at, so to kick it off, let's first meet our speakers. First up, we have co-founder and CEO of Lift Lab, previous founder of Datasong, which successfully exited to market share, John Wallace. John Wallace, welcome to the show. Hey, John. It's John and John here. And so that's that's how I got the JLo nickname. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Philippe. Philippe is the CEO and co-founder of Tatari, a technology company that builds infrastructure to modernize TV advertising for brands, agencies, and publishers. Philippe is also known uh, as the co-founder of Shazam, one of the most widely used music apps in the world. Prior Have you ever used the JLo? Oh, all the time. All the time. <laughs> okay. Y all right. You bet. Uh, <laughs> so welcome to the show, Philippe. Glad to have you on. Yeah, thank you. I do feel a little bit tricked when they told me it's hosted by JLo. I got all excited. No, don't take it personal, uh, John. But nevertheless, I do want to hijack um, the first 20, 30 seconds of your uh, emceeing, uh, JLo, because uh, I'm not sure to what extent even you guys all know this, but it's somebody's birthday today. <laughs> it's John's. John is turning 28. So, John. Happy, That's happy right. birthday. This is a beautiful cake that my daughter made. And happy birthday. Cheers, buddy, to you. <laughs> happy birthday, John. Right. That was well hijacked. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, yes, happy birthday, John. And uh, for the live audience, uh, say who you are, where you work. Wish John a happy birthday. And if there's any questions as we're uh, having the conversation, I'll try my best to work them into the conversation. So, uh, again... Yeah. I yeah, I mean, I mean, for us, it's interesting because we've done this show now. Uh, we're on month six, and it's the first time we're hosting with someone from, uh, you know, a media channel itself. And you know, we measure Tatari, and we measure all the suspects, I guess, you know, in Lift Lab. But I've always acknowledged uh, that any media channel has to also have its own measurement. Uh, so you know, here. Uh, Philippe's kind of kind enough to come on and share some of his experience. But I, I think across, we have shared customers, but I think across the Lift Lab customer base, what I see is, a, you know, a kind of a, a sustained appetite to try out uh, different forms of TV, connected TV, and trying to see it, where does it fit in their media plan. And, you know, we have a clear uh, role in measuring it, but every, um, you know, every marketing channel should be well equipped to measure itself as well, right? This is like a, an and, you know, not an or. So kind of welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for being the first. You know, there may be other media channels that end up, you know, on here. The last, yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, you know, we're, we're not here to give you the secret sauce of Lift Lab and, and find out how we grade things. But uh, no, uh, I what I always tell media channels is just, just have Lift, right? That's all you got to do. There's nothing else to it than that. And uh, you kind of wouldn't be here and have the growth that you had in the in the roster of brands that you have if if there was no lift in, in what you're doing. Uh, I know we've run uh, some uh, geo experiments on Tatari and kind of lift to see that performance kind of come out the other end. Um, all right, J Lo, uh, why don't you sure. uh, why don't you find this back? Let's uh, let's start with the questions. So uh, I guess since you've been working at Tatari, you have quite a wealth of knowledge around television. So wh why are brands coming to TV still? I thought everyone cut cables and replaced it. So those are some of the trends we hear. Obviously, those are not true. Can you give us a little bit of perspective of where we were at and where we're going in the TV landscape? Yeah, actually, that is kind of a bit of a compounded question. So maybe I'll just peel it back in, in that Please. order. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. Like uh, even today, sometimes I hear this notion, especially in the press, that TV is dead. Right? It just feels like old school media compared to, you know, mobile gaming and, and just gaming in general and stuff like that. The, the reality is, and for everybody listening live or or later, is that um, um, people watch more television today than ever before. Uh, if you were to ask Nielsen. Uh, they will say that the average American watches uh, over 32 hours of TV every day and actually more in kind of the, the winter months. 
uh, that's a lot of TV, right? Because actually, I don't watch a lot of a lot of TV myself. So there's somebody out there that watches 64 hours to make up for the average of 32. There's a few reasons for that. Uh, I think it's good to reconsider those two. Uh, there's there's more and better content, high quality content than ever. The number of scripted shows on TV is literally three, four x of what it was 10 years ago. Um, I mean, John, when when you and I grew up, you know, I mean, at least in Belgium, in small time Belgium, you could choose from three channels. <laughs> Nowadays, there are hundreds, excuse me, thousands of linear and streaming channels to pick from, and they're all great. Uh, and then the biggest thing, and I think everybody just skips over this. That's a little less than 10 years ago when you watch TV, it was kind of, you know, appointment viewing. The show is on at X time, and that's when you watch. Now, the majority of all viewing and content is on exactly when you want it. And so TV is just an overall much better experience. And so, not surprisingly, more people than ever watch TV. Uh, which then, of course, you know, if in a self-serving way, I will always say it's great for brands mm -hmm. to be on TV, right? Um, I think the second part of your question is where is it headed? No, that's an easy one. Uh, it's it's a one-way ticket towards uh, streaming TV. Uh, the the idea of you know having single programming, whatever you want to call it, delivered via cable just makes no sense in the world of IP technology. Um, um, I will say this. Um, I'm just having some conversation here. It's like, I actually think we also need to distanciate ourselves from this concept of linear versus streaming TV. And I'm going to tease John a little bit here, but John, I've got a question for you. It's a trick question. So you're going to, you're going to get it wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't matter what your answer is. Just heads up. Um, Thursday night football on Amazon, linear or streaming? Uh, I'm not a football fan, so I get to guess either of them. I guess both. <laughs> I know my kids would watch it streaming right? Sling or, you know, one of those. And I think you probably can tune in to with an antenna and actually watch it. So it's both. Yeah. Actually, you know, you're the first person who gets it right before the wrong reasons, but it's still good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hashtag winning right here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Look, some people will correctly argue it's linear TV because it's Thursday night football. The game starts at, I don't know, 7 PM and you all tune in at the game. So that right. makes it linear, but hang on a bit. It's on Amazon. It's IP delivered. That makes it streaming too. So which one is it, right? And I think um, whenever nowadays I see these industry statistics of X percent as linear, Y percent as streaming, well, what definition did you apply? Right. And so as much as I say, right, JLo, to your question, where is it heading? Streaming, yeah, for sure. But streaming with a pinch of salt because it all depends on how you define. Yeah. Do you know how much I know about football? Because I didn't realize it was only Amazon. I thought you could catch that, uh, that game over an antenna. I guess you, you can't. It's, so, uh, so with the definitions, uh, where does broadcast fit in the mix? This is a question from Cassie here in the chat. Yeah, so the uh, the industry experts will uh, define linear TV as cable, broadcast, and satellite. Yes, there's still a lot of satellite. Mm -hmm. So broadcast is part of linear, right? Because you all got the watch to show at the same time if you want to see it. I see. And with all the different paths to consumption that you're you're talking about for television, how does that make things complicated from a measurement standpoint, from a targeting tracking standpoint, with more options, more channels, more ways to consume? That's an interesting one. I like complexity because complexity creates opportunity, right? Um, um, uh, when it comes to measurement, and now I have to put on the Tatari hat in, in a little narrow way, when it comes to the measurement of just TV, it doesn't mean that we have to have different data sets and different models for measuring, right? Um, um, uh, at a high level, when it's streaming TV, we can do something which is more deterministic in nature, right? We find the exact connection between, you know, the ad delivery and the response to the ad. Uh, when it's linear TV, we often uh, work with more um, probabilistic models, where we look at a cohort of people who are watching at the same time, and how do that co how does that cohort of people respond together? Um, that would be the short answer. I see. So with with those metrics, how do you see television perform with the sound site in motion, like comparatively across the landscape? Is there any tips or tricks for the practitioners in the audience? Do, do you mind elaborating on that question a little bit? Sorry, making sure I understood it. The yeah. connection between TV and sound and motion? Oh, no, so television has the sound site in motion, so it's a high mm -hmm. impact unit. So with that, how would practitioners leverage, you know, this complexity and opportunity that you mentioned to get better results? Yeah, I kind of see them orthogonal. Look, 
how shall I? I often say, right, in the, the old saying is like a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Mm -hmm. And if a second of video has 25 picture frames in it, then a second of video is 25,000 whopping words, right? Mm -hmm. So a 30, 30 second commercial is a lot of words, more than you could ever place in an ad word. And so, um, so I don't think this answers your question directly, but to me, it says that, uh, and again, this is because I, you know, speak and I'm kind of an advocate and evangelist for TV advertising. But to me, it says that it's an incredible vehicle. It's an incredible medium to be on. Um, and I'm not trying to be disparaging to other types of channels. Everybody should do search. Everybody should do social, uh, but not being on TV because it's such a powerful uh, channel, right? But you call it sound, sign, motion. I like that. Um, I mean, you got to be there. Yeah, you, know, you want to tell the story about your product, its functional benefits, or the brand and what it stands for. No better place. Well, I mean, Philip, this is a softball one for you, uh, but I think there's people listening that would kind of be curious. Uh, I remember you getting Tatari going, and uh, and kind of much like what we had to do to lift up, kind of test the floor of you know what's a small customer uh what's a small budget that you know at least makes it like worth their while where they you know they can kind of you know recoup their creative costs and and be have a, a prayer of measuring a small amount of you know media so you probably know that floor a lot better than other people can you just kind of elaborate on uh you know what a modest budget is but is not a waste I mean, at some point, yeah. I know it's drop in the bucket, you you wouldn't try it. But isn't there some kind of threshold where things start to kind of be visible? Yeah, yeah. Let's answer in the context of history. So I actually, I was a TV advertiser myself, right? This is how you kind of like true personal experience get into the game. A company is called True Cardinal, that it matters much. Um, um, and I mean, I will never forget the buy-in price. It's like a poker game, literally, right? Um, it was about $3 million, right? A solid quarter million dollars on that commercial the 30 seconds and then the rest on media um and obviously three million dollars that instantly makes it a big big budget brand privilege right um when we started tatari we brought that entry point down to about a hundred thousand dollars it's kind of like shocking right wow. seven eight years ago and, and it was not that we came up with a hundred thousand dollars because we thought that was you know you know hundred thousand dollars but it was uh, especially in the predominance still of linear TV back then, it gave us enough statistical significance to get a signal in terms of the effectiveness of TV. Now, with streaming, with more data, better methodologies, we have a, a significant amount of brands starting with as little as ten or twenty thousand dollars. So very accessible, and maybe you know people. It's always have. based, yeah. The number is based on just, 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 just enough money to. To get signal. Can you tell us a little bit of uh, the differences between the brands, the metrics that you look at? I feel like TV is trying to be digital. Digital's trying to be TV a little bit, um, you know, with your YouTubes versus your TV. So curious what your thoughts are for those small brands versus the big brands of what they measure and what they look at. Ooh, I mean, by the way, actually, I think this is the question that matters the most in the world of TV advertising. <laughs> it's probably the hardest question for a company like Tatari to solve it and why we partner up with, with companies like Lift Lab. Um, try to keep it short. I find that difficult, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, the majority of brands um, that we always say join Tatari, um, uh, it's actually their first TV, TV campaign. Um, but don't be a miss. Uh, these companies have very rich and expert digital experiences behind them. They are expert typically in search and social media, and they just got to scale and branch out and get into new channels. And so uh, TV comes out. Uh, but it also means that they come to the world of TV advertising with uh, not just digital expectations, like, you know, fast measurement and fast media execution. But they also come into it with digital KPIs. Right. Um, well, what's my row assets going kind to of return on ad spend? And then that's like the most obvious one. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the, the beauty of TV actually doesn't lay in that small spend. The beauty of TV lays in the fact that it's a huge market. It's $90 billion per year in the US. For comparison, for example, uh, radio is $6 billion. So in simple English, there's 15 times more scale in TV than there is in radio. 
right? And so the best TV advertisers are the ones that not only kind of like, right, um, grasp those digital components to launch their TV campaign, but then can quickly grow out of them and take a much more holistic view of their company than, than that just, just direct performance uh, piece. And if that if that yeah. was if I was talking Greek here, then uh, you know we can you can rewind me and uh, <laughs> no, I, I I think that's 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 a great answer. Um, with with uh, these expectations and you know digital native sort of brands, how does data science come into the mix uh, and measuring those those metrics? You've got some data scientists on the staff there, right, Philippe? I mean, I, that's a you know even all the way back to your early days, you've had quite a bit of technology. Uh, uh, and, and kind of a measurement, uh, you know, kind of, uh, Slam. yeah, background. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, like, look, the, the Tari team is uh, roughly 300 to, let's say, 40 people kind of in the data science uh, uh, group. Um, um, uh, but that, by the way, just to give you a little bit of a, an overview, uh, not all of it goes to measurement. The, the application of data science and the media buying process is as important, by the way. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, a, a big chunk of our data science effort and resources go into measurements. Um, but but I always say it's 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 a little bit uh, limited or narrow, right? Mm -hmm. Because as a TV company, we just seek almost a direct causal relationship between an ad or an impression yeah. and what happens after that. Um, Right, that direct connection. The reality is, is that again, the beauty of TV does so much more. Right, the old saying, "All rising tides lift all boats." Right, but if you run an ad in the Super Bowl, right, and I, I use the Super Bowl because you can, right, by by illustrating the extremes, it's easier to understand the averages. Right, but if you run an ad in the Super Bowl, it's not just thirty seconds; mm -hmm. it's thirty seconds to the largest audience ever possible. By the way, your Airing next to uh, Geico and 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 and, and Coca Cola, and so you can signal prestige, you can signal um, uh, quality, you can suggest that you're really big, right? And so the effect of that is way more than seeing the ad and then say buy the product in the next five minutes. Nobody, by the way, buys a car within five minutes of seeing a commercial. Nobody or during, does. Or during the football game, probably. Right. Or during the football game. <laughs> so it, it is what happens after that. And people who, by the way, like air in the Super Bowl or have placement is better English now in the Super Bowl, uh, they will see those positive effects from that for months after. But they'll never see that causal relationship directly with the Super Bowl. If anything, we actually often have a joke at that at the Tari, right? When we finally got people over the hump and like, hey, look, let's move into brand-like advertising, which is called. Um, Two months later, come back. It's like yeah, it's amazing. Or organic traffic is up. <laughs> is that really organic? <laughs> right. So, so the latent effects of television and and uh, is something that comes up pretty frequently with market mix models and any sort of bottom funnel measurement. Um, how do you separate? Because this is a conversation that comes up a lot: upper funnel versus lower funnel, brand versus performance in the world of Tatari. Sorry, Jada. What, what was it? What, what, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't, sorry, hear, the, I didn't the, hear the question part. <laughs> yeah, the, the question is: uh, when an advertiser is coming to you with a brand or performance, how do you separate that out? What type of metrics or campaigns do you care about? Because typically they'll say, "I'll have this type of campaign or that type of campaign." How do you treat them differently? Can I deflect your question a little bit by first stating that uh, for us, like the difference between performance and brand, have you know those lines become very blurry. Uh, yeah. 10 years ago, um, when you want to buy a spot in a program, if it was a brand creative and you declared it brand, you would literally have to call a different team at the cable or broadcast network uh, to buy that spot at three x the price for the person who went to that network and said like, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a DR spot. By the way, you would air next to each other. Like that's how different it was. Obviously that doesn't exist anymore. Um, even in creative, I find that the lines become blurry, right? A, a, a DR creator was all about buying the product, showing its functional benefits and, and, and usefulness, and, and the brand creative is more kind of like aspirational in nature. And even those things, you know, if you look at some of the companies that we work with, they, they mix those two components beautifully. 
um, together. Uh, Vinny, the CMO of Chime, puts it so eloquently. You know, he calls him, he talks about brand performance because ultimately, when you run brand TV, and I'll and I think I'll get to your question in a moment. Um, when you get to brand TV, um, it's more than just kind of creating an association with the company and the product. The ultimate end goal is down the road to do a sale, right? right? Um, and I think he 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 really gets that well. So. Um, where does that leave us? I mean, stuff, yeah. I mean, it almost opens up. There's a question in the coming in from the audience. It's um, kind of, I, I, if I paraphrase the question, you know, a lot of our customers have a full media plan that they measure. But I guess you're taking brands through making a TV media plan, right? So it might have elements of uh, kind of brand in nature and performance in nature. And you're saying you're blurring the line between them. It also, like the placements that came up earlier on the call, you know, that's where the nature of this question lies is, um, you know, are you kind of setting teams up to buy some proportion of linear and, and streaming? Um, you know, so maybe you can just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, would you say it's streaming only until you hit this threshold or vice versa, that it's linear only until, you know, maybe, and, you know, it sounds like now we have two dimensions of a question about media planning, kind of performance versus brand. And then right on the, Inside. Yeah. That's right. Thanks for bringing me back, John. As always, um, <laughs> streaming versus linear. We actually almost we, we don't make the distinction anymore. Remember yeah. my 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 silly question in the beginning. Like you truly have to be kind of like uh, fluid between the two of them. And yes, we have some brands that, as a matter of fact, run 100% on streaming because when they probed linear, it was a dot, and vice versa. On average, and as measured by media volume or tonnage in dollars. I'd say 60% will be cable broadcast, 40% will be streaming. Uh, and guess what? Kind of aligns with what you see in the broad viewership statistics and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so so that part, I'm going to put aside. I, have, uh, I mean, I know this, have the prices kind of merged, converged a little bit between them as well? I'm assuming. Nope, nope, nope. The ago. CPMs, again, like big picture, I'd say the at Tatari. The CPMs yeah. for uh, streaming TV are typically about three to five x, possibly higher than linear. The response rates, however, are also much yeah. higher, and so on. Makes up for it. Okay, so it honestly, like, I uh, you probe, you test, mm -hmm. you assess. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting piece about brand versus um, DR, so to speak, when we talk about brand, it's really about how do we built awareness mm -hmm. and so the focus on reach and associated with that frequency metrics are way more important mm -hmm. um and and actually it's a continuous education that we have to do and i think holistic measurement can help us in that but it's continuous education of making sure that people don't myopically focus on just these row as numbers right mm -hmm. because in the end what might happen is they end up keep it almost becomes a vicious circle they they keep mm -hmm. buying Cheap media, right? Because it creates great ROAS, uh, but cheaper media means typically smaller reach, a, a small, a small cable network, and and they would have been much better off buying a little bit more expensive media, but but a much bigger aperture, a 10x reach, introducing new people to the product, the service, and whichever it is, and so. Sure, yeah. All right. So once once we get into what the industry likes to call brand advertising, we actually we will almost say like stop stop paying attention to the Taris measurement, mm -hmm. at least as it comes to kind of these you know cost per visitor and CPI and ROAS uh, types of metrics. Uh, but really, um, uh, let us guide you by things like reach. Uh, let us guide you by um, blended CPA, not TV CPA and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, uh, and and again, this is where where you guys come in, right? Yeah. Uh, because yeah. we just do TV, and then uh, MMMs are just just a much much better vehicle. Right? Is, is yeah, there a certain I, threshold uh, when you switch over between like the? Uh, is there like a number that you would say uh, once you hit this, you probably want to go more into this, and below that, you might want to stay in this camp? Yeah, that's an awesome question. I actually I don't know, but can I just shoot from the hip? Just you know, because sure, I can't. Thank you. I'd yeah. say if, you do, if your budget is twenty million total mark, I'm 
forget about TV. If your total marketing budget is $20 million, maybe even less than that, $10 million per year, I think you should be doing an MMM. Mm -hmm. Again, it's about the statistical significance. And now anybody who's a data scientist on this call might be cringing and saying like, oh, there's not enough signal with $10 million. That's cool. Like as soon as you get signal, go for it. Right. Gotcha. I, I Can guess I ask a question back? What's, what do you guys see? At what point do you guys see? Yeah. Um, so yeah, for a market mix models, I would say 5 million is usually a good starting ah. place. Below that, uh, below that is a little, little too small to kind of get for the sample. Uh, John, would you agree? 5 million? Low, I mean, we've mark. measured below 5 million, but uh, you know, that's also kind of an interesting point of spin where you start to see enough channels in the media plan that you need a, a helping hand. Right. If you've got your spin concentrated on a couple of channels, you might not need a multivariate kind of approach to studying things. You can kind of try to, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of try to uh, decipher things on your own. So that that for me, it, it they go hand in hand, the, the number of channels and, and the amount of spin. But it's certainly the number of channels. Once, once you're spinning on five channels, six channels, there's a much stronger chance uh, that one of them saturated and you don't know it. Right. Right. Uh, and how, so how about duration? How much duration do you guys want? Like a month, two months of spend? Well, so for the mixed modeling, um, you know, we're starting it out. We backfill and we started out with a year of data, but some of the channels might not have been on the whole year. So the kind of once you start to try to say how low can you go, we would actually uh, turn that into a, a, an experiment opportunity. You can run an experiment in six weeks and get a hell of a lot more signal than trying to put six weeks of data into a mixed model. So that's our own learning and our own kind of best practices. And and I'm, I would assume if you have a new customer, you would encourage them to commit to probably six or eight weeks before they ever can, you know, make, make a read on, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine someone just trying to, try a new, any new channel out, like especially CTV and just saying, you know, I, I make or break it week two or week four. Right. Uh, you know, this is, this kind of, uh, is, is a question from the audience. Alexis asks, is there any cue between linear TV and CTV or streaming TV? Are there sweet spots around TRPs or frequency and or frequency? And I just like answer yes and move on and just get, you know, get excited. <laughs> I think they want numbers. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. fine. <laughs> give us the numbers, Philip. I mean, it's interesting. I'll give you a second to kind of formulate a thought. You know, we uh, walk around, uh, you know, espousing to brands like what you should be thinking about is saturation, uh, right? Price is secondary. You need, you can't ignore price. It's, it's a clear uh, signal on whether you have enough or too much of something, but uh, I can take the price and set it aside for a moment and just say, is what I'm buying saturated or not? Uh, and so we're going to see forms of saturation in any media, right? There's I don't know of any channel, even the $90 billion TV market, that is up and to the right forever, right? It just doesn't exist. And so, right, we we we, we find that in our mixed model, our job is to go, uh, it's to quantify saturation because there's different saturation rates for different different types of media and different brands and how long they've been in the media and that kind of thing, how big the audience is that they're chasing. Uh, and um, there's different decays on this, different saturations. All of that for us is just part of what we live for. Uh, you know, it, it, it's in its simplest form. And that's what you, we were hinting at earlier on this show is that if you're not spinning on TV, then it certainly isn't saturated. And that's why kind of cracking into a new channel is, is attractive to brands, right? They've maybe already saturated search or maybe maybe they grew up on Instagram and they've kind of saturated that channel. Uh, that's when they go kind of looking for a company like Tatari. Um, so I, I answered in a general nature. Maybe the question was a little bit now. No, I think, I, think, I, I think you're right. I mean, then once you get into TV, then where do you saturate again, right? And, and I was trying, I, I thought it was a good question. I'm just trying to come up with like a number that was a telltale. And I don't think there is one. We just pay attention, right, to the fact that when you, in a certain TV or inventory entity, when you start buying up a lot of that inventory, uh, all of a sudden you just you just see your performance falling off or you can look at your frequency and it's just really going to a level like, you know, let's say 15. It's like that just feels too much, uh, but it really comes more like it manifests itself more in like, hey, you know, I, I keep spending uh, more and my, my overall performance in the company is not being impacted, right? I might have great ROAS in the channel, but as a company, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not moving up. Uh, and, and that's when we, that, I said, that's when the brand conversation begins. 
Um, I've, and I've, I, I tell this, I will share this though quickly. Uh, some companies get really lucky. They can just really fo- keep focusing on these short-term metrics and run TV, TV at the tune of $10, $15 million per year because maybe they found great success in sports. And there's a lot of inventory in sports. Other companies, they hit that ceiling at three, $4 million, right? Mm-hmm. Super fast. And that's when the that's when the hard work begins, right? Because then you have to buy these brand-like impressions. They're more expensive. By the way, sometimes you have to commit for, to them, like you know, i.e. the upfront gets even worse. And then you don't see the immediate impact. I call it surviving the nuclear winter, <laughs> right? I, I love the drama associated with that. I, this might be outdated from a metric standpoint, but I heard two to five frequency a week is typically where a lot of those brand advertisers hit. Is that way off base? That's outdated info? Or is that kind of a, a general rule of thumb that's still accepted? Uh, I don't know anything more about what we, you and I have read about this. I think every brand is different. It's this nonsense. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Okay. So outdated or or possibly nonsense or is nonsense. Great. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about Tatari then? Uh, tell me about like what's um, separating you from the pack in terms of execution, media buying, performance. Like what what about um, your platform is uh, is the differentiator from the other competitors out there? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we, we do our own measurement, uh, and we're very proud of it, but I don't want to spend too much time with it because I will always admit, as I said, it's very, uh, limiting, um, um, the need to work with companies like Cliff Flap is very much there. As we just learned, you start to hit the $5 million marketing budgets. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, beyond that, um, look, um, in terms of the. TV advertising platforms, I'd say we are unique or differentiated in the sense that uh, about half of our clients can do it completely themselves. Um, uh, and so it gives the right self-serve, whatever you want to call it, but it gives them a level of control and future expertise that's really unprecedented. This sounds weird, right? But if you think about Google AdWords, the better Google AdWords advertisers or managers don't work at Google. They work at the companies that we all work with. And so to the extent that we can let people drive their own campaigns, they actually become better TV advertisers than us. So half of the brands joining Tatari today, they actually want to do it themselves. And we give them all the tools to do it. So that's one big point of differentiation. Um, Another big point of differentiation is, of course, is that we don't just do streaming. All the the new TV advertising platforms, even the traders, they are limited to streaming. I know it's the future, but remember, we just talked about it. Streaming is still only 40%. It's going to move up. Um, And then in media execution, some of this is abstract and a little harder to talk about. Um, But uh, whilst there's a lot of talk and seemingly preference for programmatic execution, um, uh, Tatari will uh, uh, kind of execute the the bulk, 95% of its media direct. Uh, uh, We literally have the technology through building and acquisition or we go directly into the ad servers to place the buy. So we almost bypass the programmatic chain. Uh, and in that, of course, um, cut out quite a few middlemen, uh, have less data loss and things like that. So those are some of the big differences. He's dealt with very proud. Right. Uh, we have another question from the audience. This seems a little on the tactical side. Uh, so I think the answer might be it depends, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, let's say that you don't invest in linear or CTV and you're a record airline, how much should you invest to generate enough significance in order to understand ROI impacts from that channel within the U.S. market? I oh, think that depends I'm, on the brand. Depends. I was just going to say it depends on the airline. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know um, surprisingly, not that much. Um, when we onboard new clients, we often do a reverse calculation. How much media should you drive, depending on what you buy, to to rise above the noise, so to speak, and get that statistical significance? So, um, so for some some companies it's very little. For some companies it's a little more. But I, I can say with great confidence that even if you're a significant company with loads of traffic already, um, uh, you can run a successful TV pilot at the tune of say two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars and find enough learnings to decide on the future of your of the channel. Wow. That's that sounds and TV number is very low. That's incredible. 
Cool. Um, and I was thinking about it. You know, we always answer these questions uh, at face value. And then there's always someone that comes along. But what about, and I think for the, since it's an airline that we're talking about, um, I just want to say, but, and what about, um, you know, conversion rate, right? And, and therefore in your price, like if you're, if you're the high priced airline and you're trying to buy your way uh, to a bunch more conversions and you buy all that traffic and no one buys a ticket, uh, you know, don't, don't shoot the messenger. I mean, it could be Google, Facebook, <laughs> CTV, anybody, you know, uh, you know, keep that in mind. But I guess I, uh, if you're, if you're kind of like have a kind of, I guess, healthy market share and it's not going down dramatically and your, you know, your prices are at least competitive, then it sounds like you ought to be able to, you know, use paid media to increase, um, you know, increase traffic. Kind of another thing that we said earlier on the call, um, and I and I think uh, when you, I hear these questions from the audience, uh, keep in mind that you can have any row as you want. And you were kind of hinting at that, Philippe, right? If you go really, really narrow and you just say, I'm only going to do sports, right? And that works for me. And and you don't spend a lot of money on sports, you're going to have a row as it's through the roof, right? But you've traded off scale for, you know, efficiency. So, I mean, yep. I like to say row as can be manipulated, uh, you know, and so that for me, when we, when we tell folks, it, this really is a game about um, understanding saturation. The other way I say it is you're buying scrutiny of the media, right? If you have an appetite to scrutinize the media's performance, you're, you're going to then find the pockets of, uh, in the media plan where you haven't spent enough. In other words, you'll take a small decrease in ROAS, but you'll get a lot more, uh, you know, scale and conversion. And so that, that, uh, that came up earlier on the, on the call. And I, I always feel like you can look at your ROAS all day long, but you can also, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I can cut the spin and make the ROAS go up just like any other marketer. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, clearly the trade off there is growth, right? Revenue and growth. I am fascinated by the airline question though. Do you know, John, it's my, dream job just for a year no more than that to be ceo <laughs> of a major airline one day i think it's give it up after a year too let me try <laughs> i think for sure but i think it's the most complex job ever you have to be good at you know strategy right how you're gonna your routing and you're gonna be good at finance and customer service and marketing right uh so anyway um yeah, yeah, i think richard branson's I think Richard Branson said once, you know, I can't tell you how to make a billion dollars, but I could tell you how to lose a billion dollars and that's start an airline. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I, that's an old one, right? How do you become a millionaire? Start as a billionaire? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think he showed the world on that one. That's that's it. Um, if there's no other questions from the audience, I think we could wrap a little bit early. We'll, we'll do a, a quick, anyone has any questions if they want to type it in? All right. Well, and Jayla, we need to make sure we uh, talk about where we're going from here. Uh, in terms of the next episode or yeah, in terms of, yeah, course. Right. We're, we're, we're not off the air. Well, we, we're going to be back. Yep. Our, our next one is July 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Pacific. We have Elcat Matt, Matt and in Ska. Is that how you say it? Sky? Ska? Yeah, that's Guy. Yeah. yeah. He's the VP of uh, or v, VP of Growth consumer marketing and e-commerce at El Caterden. And El Caterden is a private equity company that has over 30 billion uh, under management, assets under management. So we're really excited to talk to him about the incest, in, investment strategy, brand growth, and more. So again, thank you to the audience for the questions. Thank you, Philippe, for attending. And thank you, John, um, for uh, the episode. Yeah, we're going to cut it up and distribute it. Yep. Yeah, guys. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye. Thanks,